So who am I? I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Alberta. My talk today is called Archaeological Remote Sensing with Indigenous Communities in Canada. Also, if you see me looking back and forth, it's because I have two screens. Um, and it's what it's going to be this talk is a more general look at some of the research I've done with Indigenous communities in Alberta. Before I begin, I want to respectfully acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Amiskachi, Wisconsin, which is now known as Edmonton, Alberta, which is in Treaty 6 territory, and it's the traditional lands of many First Nations people, as well as the Métis. It was a gathering place forever. So over the course of this talk, I'll be introducing what I mean by archaeological remote sensing, what it is, um, and we'll discuss GPR as a particular method, or ground penetrating radar, as a particular method used frequently nowadays in Indigenous contexts, and why, along with other geophysical remote sensing techniques, it really, really rocks. Um, as a final note, I wanted to mention that the data presented today was all eth ethically obtained on community-driven projects. I was invited to be there. Um, it was through their enc the encouragement of these community relationships that I feel comfortable presenting you some of the results today. Without further ado, let's get going. There we go. Should, should have changed. Let me know if it doesn't. As many of you will know, remote sensing is commonly defined as the art and science of obtaining information about an object from a distance, which is pretty vague, but this is good because it encompasses all sorts of wonderful technologies, but makes my job a little bit harder to explain what I'm talking about. For the purposes of this talk, remote sensing will include ground-based geophysics, UAV or drone and airborne applications of remote sensing sensors, and satellite remote sensing in GIS. And it probably does more. It also includes more, but but where does archaeology fit, fit into this? Well, tech-savvy archaeologists have been using these techniques for years to make their lives just a little bit easier. This is a process frequently called archaeological prospection or archaeological geophysics, and I'll be touching upon some of the earliest uses of these te techniques and just opposing these with some modern case studies from my work soon. So my master's research was set on trying to expand this previous definition of remote sensing to be more inclusive of Indigenous communities' goals and objectives. Therefore, when I use the term archaeological remote sensing, what I mean is to use new and emerging remote sensing technologies to aid in solving explicitly archaeological questions while being reflexive of their impact to modern communities. In order to properly understand, interpret, and purport the data we collect, we must acknowledge and include diverse knowledges and perspectives to augment and focus surveys. In my experience, this has always yielded exceptional results when it comes to remote sensing studies and has aided in the development of many community relationships I, that I continue to be inspired by during my PhD. So let's take a brief look and show some cool stuff about how these techniques that are commonly employed today were used in the history of archaeology. So first off, is pretty obvious. Aerial photography is awesome, as most of us will know, and a lot of people will be familiar with Gaspar Felix Tornichon's or NADAR and his um, hot air balloon experiments, but also Julius Nuremberg's famous pigeon photography, which is possibly my favorite thing in remote sensing, um, pictured here. However, archaeologists also wanted to get a sky-high perspective, and the first use of aerial photography in archaeology was actually they, they flew over Stonehenge, obviously. In 1907, a war balloon captured the famous site in all of its glory. Um, and since then, archaeologists have been employing aerial images to locate sites, to grade in our understanding of known sites, and produce pretty compelling images of these landscapes. GIS is another tool that archaeologists have added increasingly into their repertoire, and it's a tool that will be very familiar to the Canadian Cartographic Association. And so archaeologists quickly latched onto GIS as a tool to conduct spatial analysis, but also as a database to record and manage site information. All of a sudden, it was easier than ever to understand and interpret the spatial patterning between site and regional levels. This made it far easier to see how people were living across the landscape, how people were moving across the landscape, as well as managing these archaeological resources. So North Americans were the first to incorporate this technique in the 1980s and has subsequently changed archaeology. More and more archaeologists are encouraged to take GIS classes or complete a minor in GIS while studying at university, which is definitely a positive change. As a result of this turn, some have described us living in the geospatial revolution in archaeology and it's not slowing down. And others have gone so far as to say that it's more important than the radiocarbon revolution, which is pretty significant since that 
that's pretty much normal dinner table talk saying, talking about radiocarbon dating, well, at least in my family. <laughs> Not only is archaeological GIS continuing to be a fundamental field in its own right, but it also provides a useful environment to save, process, and manipulate geophysical data, which is my next slide. Archaeologists have been experimenting with geophysics for almost a century now, and one of the earliest uses was magnetometry. And so mag magnetometry is a technique that looks at the material, prop material properties of the subsurface and see, tries to sense the different characteristics that make them more or less susceptible to magnetization or becoming a small magnet. It passively measures subtle changes in the Earth's magnetic field and tries to find objects that are actually anomalizing or like changing this magnetic field. And this happens if the object are already magnetized or remnantly magnetic. Shown on the screen is a particular kind of magnetometry that archaeologists love to use, magnetic gradiometry, which is a technique that involves two sensors. Uh, the top sensor measures the Earth's magnetic field at any given time, position, and strength, and the bottom records the Earth's magnetic field plus the magnetic fields of all the subsurface features or artifacts that might be causing anomalies in the overall magnetic field. And it's Quite simple that by subtracting the top sensor, uh, sorry, subtracting the bottom sensor by the top sensor, you're removing the Earth's magnetic field, and all you're left with is a map of these subsurface features in theory. So this is pretty cool for archaeologists who want to find those objects or features with magnetic characters. And starting in the late 1950s, folks began to experiment with techniques to locate ancient hearths, previously heated objects, metal. Soil changes from when somebody disturbs soil, the fill can be positively or negatively changed, and more. So there are also a number of papers that suggest that this technique can be used to locate unmarked graves, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Magnetics is also kind of a funny technique because, because it's quite simple as well as beautifully complex. A lot of archaeologists have weird relationships with the technique and give their instruments funny nicknames. As you can see on the right here, this is one of the first magnetic instruments used in archaeology, and it was known as the bleeper because it, of the sound it made. It's a, actually an early proton magnetometer, and this kind of got the ball rolling for archaeological geophysicists. So the last geophysical technique I wanted to introduce today is ground penetrating radar, or GPR. GPR has been in the news a lot recently because of its ability to locate unmarked graves. But Liam, how does it work? All right, GPR is a technology that has been around for a long time, and the earliest experiments actually stretch back to the early 20th century, where German scientists were using it in the Arctic to look to measure the thicknesses of glaciers. However, the more basic principles of the modern technology has only been around since the 1970s. So GPR uses radar waves or low-frequency electromagnetic radiation to non-invasively scan the subsurface. These waves reflect off these subsurface features and stratigraphy to generate a profile that appears before us. And we as experts then interpret these re reflection profiles to receive real depth, size, and character information about these subsurface features. In ideal environmental conditions, of course, GPR doesn't work everywhere. On the right, you'll see my little illustration or my attempt at an animation about how GPR works. So we have a brown square, which is supposed to represent the unknown subsurface, and a man dragging an orange box across the ground um, and so the axis on the left will be depth and the, on the axis on the top will be the distance along the surface. So the GPR is pulled in a straight line across the ground and you generate a reflection profile as seen here, right? And you can actually also then put them into, you can also collect GPR in a grid. So you do all those straight lines and in grid format, you can get a 3D cube, but we'll get back to that. Experts then make sense of these profiles and come up with a particular interpretation. As you can see here, there's a large dipping feature or channel visible in this data. Following the interpretation of these profiles, we can then add different processing filters to reduce noise, bring out contrast. Um, in A, you can see how a couple of these different features affect GPR data. We, I just show like a simple background removal, bandpass filter, like filtering out noise, just to see what it looks like. Uh, following this, if the data was collected in a grid, like I mentioned, we can arrange those profiles into a cube pattern and actually slice at a particular depth to get a bird's eye view of a site, right? Um, in B, you can see this diagram showing that these lined up radiograms and this slice going through at a particular depth. Uh, 
This process lets us create maps and products to help visualize and explain our interpretation. We can then export a lot of this data as XYZ files or rasters that can be then used in GIS to make maps. The neat thing about GPR is that its first published use in archaeology was actually relatively late compared to everybody else. It took place in the 80s. It actually took place in Newfoundland, Canada, which was great. Uh, on the right, you can see the study by Vaughn showing a researcher dragging an old GPR antenna using a 2x4. That has changed. We, we, don't, we no longer use a 2x4 here. Maybe I can point that out here. Whoop. There we go. So there's the antenna. There's the 2x4, and there's the guy pulling it across the ground in a grid. Right along there. Hopefully you can see my little laser pointer. So what's interesting about this study, though, is that GPR is frequently used to locate Umbar graves today, and it's actually not that different than when we when they first did it in the 86. So today, GPR can find unmarked graves, archaeological features, structures, and records stratigraphy. So where are we today as a field? Well, as previously mentioned, remote sensing in archaeology has been seen some exponential growth over the last few decades. And this has changed everyday practice in archaeology. Now, CRM and consultants, or cultural resource management, the consultant version archaeologists, um, often use LIDAR, GIS, and satellite remote sensing data in their everyday practice, often do plan their field work to, to plan their mitigation strategies and predict where sites could be. In fact, everyone, everyone in the field, if you look at these, uh, these current literature reviews, everyone's talking about continued technological advances better toys and more data. That's, the, that's where we're headed, which is kind of good, but it's also shockingly, it's a little disappointing that no one's actually talking about what we're doing, how we're doing it. So what are we surveying? What are we, how are we surveying it? And who are we doing it with? And to this end, there's even less discussion about ethics and working with indigenous peoples. So, which frankly isn't new. This, here's the man himself, Vine Deloria Jr. Um, indigenous peoples have long-standing criticisms against archaeology. Specifically in the 1950s and 60s, there are a number of key texts about how anthropologists were the devil, and in fact, we were to a certain extent. Uh, researchers would blow into a community, excavate, address their, commu their research questions, and leave to tell their own stories about Indigenous peoples. This kind of uncollaborative fly-in, fly-out research put a bad taste in everybody's mouth, and many communities are still resistant to archaeology to this day. Despite their criticisms, archaeologists didn't really care until the 1990s when descendant communities' concerns were finally beginning to be heard. Soon, a new paradigm, now known as Indigenous archaeology, began to take shape. And while it means different things to different people, at its heart, it's archaeology done by, with, and for Indigenous peoples. And so this is where I, my supervisor, Dr. Keisha Superintendent, and other members of, my, of the, our institute, the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology, kind of fit in. At its core, Indigenous archaeology means that communities are involved partners or often initiators in archaeology projects. Projects are grounded in respect, ongoing engagement and consent, and reflection, and throughout, and these, these qualities are taken over the entirety of the project. As much as possible, we take the time and include ceremony in our research, and whenever we can, to include and incorporate in Indigenous knowledge and community perspectives. Oh. Another key aspect of this research is to recognize that modern political realities that face communities and the unique histories of colonialism that shaped each individual place and community. Finally, it means that there are recognizing that there are clear limits to how archaeology has been practiced in the past and that we should, as much as possible, use low impact approaches to disturb as little as possible. With that in mind, Remote sensing and archaeological, you know, and geophysics sounds like a pretty sweet deal. Uh, while remote sensing has been extensively employed in indigenous contexts, it has been infrequently employed within indigenous archaeology, weirdly. Um, communities need and want expedient, minimally destructive, and cost-effective results for their heritage and legal goals. And this is where mobilizing the power of archaeological remote sensing tools could jump leaps and bounds ahead of expensive very you know, time-consuming archae traditional archaeology. However, we have to do this in an appropriate way, as if we just jump into things like how we've done th in things in the past, we could actually amplify some of those critiques. 
So while it's important to do, like while we can help, simultaneously indigenous archaeology provides remote sensing specialists ethical and moral guidance about how we can better tailor projects to be more respectful and uphold community sovereignty. As well, including indigenous knowledge in remote sensing projects improves project outcomes and makes interpretations more meaningful for everyone. So this leads me to introducing some of my PhD research. Uh, using archaeological remote sensing with and for Dene communities in Northeast Alberta, I'm you know, this is where I'm hoping to do some field work in the coming years, but unfortunately I have some stuff for my masters I'll be showing um, and I'm going to be expanding on some of the relationships that I built during my masters. So it's unequivocal that the entirety of the North American landscape is made up of indigenous lands that through colonial process, processes were unjustly appropriated from their true stewards. As a result, indigenous peoples in Canada have long fought for recognition of these losses submitted claims for adequate reparations, and in some instances, sought recovery of their territories. While much of these lands are now privately owned, large swaths are still owned by the crowns and held for specific activities. This is particularly the case in Northeast Alberta, where I'm working, uh, where the vast majority of lands are held either provincially or federally for three activities. Uh, ecological conservation, which is like Wood Buffalo National Park and other provincial parks and wildlands, Military operations, so the Cold Lake Air Weapons Range, which is a huge area in northern, north, uh, northwestern Canada, and industrial projects, which is the Athabasca oil sands and forestry operations. So Indigenous communities here are acutely aware of these, aware of these losses and intergenerational impacts that they had on their communities, their practices, and their life ways. And so archaeological remote sensing can be used as a tool to counteract these effects of disconnection and cultural erasure by helping to preserve key places, stories, and events. And so from my experience with surveys for Indigenous communities, I expect my concrete objectives to be fairly intuitive, one of them being to document and, lo and locate the historic unmarked grave burial grounds um, that are populated the landscape, and two, to record the known historic Dene settlements and investigate the changing lifeways as a result of colonial pressures, who, which often removed people from these historic places. And three, to co-create these new narratives with Western science and indigenous knowledge to produce new conceptions of these landscapes. So speaking to objective number one, I've already been involved in numerous GPR surveys for unmarked graves at the request of indigenous communities. Of particular importance is my relationship with the Chippewan Prairie First Dene First Nation in Janvier, Alberta. This community inv had invited me up because they worried about a number of their historic burial grounds and the potential of disturbance. They wanted to construct a protective fence around some of these burial grounds, but didn't not, did not accidentally want to disturb the remains. So in one instance, we used GPR to survey the area and record the graves. We went slow and with high spatial control, we flagged um, every reflection that we thought might be a grave in the field. And by the end of the day, other members of the community came out to find a clearing filled with flags um, indicating graves. And as you might expect, it, it was a quite a powerful experience for people as this was, the place kind of being remembered. So stories began to flow and people began to be re-anchored to this place and talking about the relatives that were buried there. After I processed the data back to the lab, the results were unbelievably clear as far as GPR data goes, which doesn't always end up this well. Um, 12 graves were convincingly identified in two loose rows and they were all oriented toward the lake. It was on top of a sandy uh, clearing and these matched really well are infield identifications, which also doesn't normally happen. So we ultimately recommended a minimum fence boundary of about four, 14 by 14 meters, and plans are in place to remark the graves and construct the fence. But just to talk about this slide here for a second. So we look at every profile, and what I do is I mark down the X, Y, Z of where they are. Um, so this will be, we're looking at the three feet results, so about three to four feet, and traditionally this is much more appropriate than the six feet Christian burial style. Um, and then what I did was I took that three foot depth slice and just put it underneath. Um, I overlaid those these post maps, these dots on top. And you can see that there's actually a great correlation between those profiles and that depth slice, which is what we're looking for if we want to be, it doesn't always happen, but when we see them together, that's usually a really good sign that these are in fact graves. And this is our final recommendation with the red box being a square, uh, like a nice square on it, 14 by 14 meters. Here's another view in 3D 
um, you can see that there's nothing around this clearing, and then we can see the grapes. So the red box, the red, the red, uh, red reflections are what we're looking for. They're almost some of these are almost in rectangles. So the other places that hold great significance for communities are the houses, cabins, and settlements where people lived. Um, and when I, while I haven't had the pleasure of working on a historical archaeological site with Denny communities yet, plans are in place for next summer to work on a couple. Um, so fingers crossed, COVID and weather uh, uh, willing. So, but what I had had is the opportunity to try these techniques out on a Métis site um, in southern Saskatchewan, and what they were they were effective at locating even the faintest remains of these historic cabins down south. So this gives me optimism that my future work will work well with these denny communities in the boreal forest and so let me just go through some cool stuff from chimney coulee in southern saskatchewan so here's some of the gpr data and while there was no visible surface markers i was able to see that there's this clear wall in this profile i i identified with this little red ryu this was a wall that i saw in the profile and it looked like it was a straight line with right corners i also saw that there's this big messy area in the back here where it looked like there's rocks and piled up and it was all disturbed. And so I, initially we, I interpreted this as, as this might be where the chimney was, um, which was both, both these features were also visible in the magnetic radiometry data. And what's really cool is then we sunk two 50 by 50 centimeter excavation units to test this. And this is not something we always do in archeological remote sensing, but we were able to do it this time. And so A, you can see here is this line of, um, I identified as the cabin wall that would turn have turned and been a square like this. And what we found right exactly where we saw it was this line of cabin wood in this more of a woody trench, but this is what it was picking up, is this really ephemeral remains of this cabin. The chimney, which we saw is this brilliant red, highly positive uh, anomaly. This ended up being exactly what we thought it was, this mess of chimney stone, burnt animal bone, and charcoal, which represented the chimney of this cabin. And so in front of it, we also found all these um, artifacts that were related to beading, Métis beadwork, which was incredible. So all in all, we deemed that these geophysical techniques were incredibly successful, even when looking for ephemeral archaeological materials that may have been missed or neglected with traditional survey or, ex or even traditional archaeological excavation. So, Coming to the end of the talk, <laughs> we've made it. Uh, my take home messages for you today are that while technological advancements in surveying and mapping are exciting, we must always remember that the majority of research is always on Indigenous contexts. Thus, methodologies need to change in order to take into account community needs and objectives. Part of this is remote sensing changing archaeology to better fit community needs, but part, part of this is Indigenous archaeology changing remote sensing to be more respectful and appropriate. All in all, um, in order to bridge this gap appropriately, we need to follow community leads and conduct research that matters to them. It's really that simple. And so thank you very much for your time today. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the Chief and Council as well as the community members and elders of the Chippewa and Prairie Dene First Nation for asking us to conduct this research, funding the project, and giving us the permission to disseminate the results. Thank you also to the Métis Nation of Alberta, who our, who our lab works collect, uh, collaboratively with on projects like Chimney Cooley, I'd also like to thank my supervisor and mentors, Dr. Keisha Supernan and Dr. Abe Dersh, for continuously pointing me in the right direction and leading me to a down a rewarding path. Finally, I'd like to thank the Bacall Archaeology Project for letting me borrow their equipment, Shirk University of Alberta, and the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology for funding my studies. So thank you. Sorry if I went a little fast, and I'm happy to receive any questions at this time or go back to previous maps or data. Thanks very much for your presentation, William. That was excellent. Um, we do have a couple of questions popping into the chat. So Fraser Taylor is asking um, a landscape archaeology question. Archaeological research is often highly site specific in nature. How would you map a wider cultural context? How would mapping the wider context help, he says. So the way I interpret that is, um, and I'm not sure, Fraser, if I'm getting your question right, but so if it's site specific, how do we bring it up to the regional level? And I think that's, so when we're talking about more like how I'm approaching my PhD research is working with Dene Sulane communities um, 
yeah, how do we take all these communities, all these sites and bring it into like a similar thing? And I think it comes down to using high resolution uh, mapping and geophysical strategies, as well as working with the communities and listening to them and saying, if they're saying, well, you know, we're families that were separated by boundaries, like it's, we're the same folks, right? And that's some of the communities I work with. Um, we can start making those connections, especially with historical archaeology sites where we have information about who was there. Um, I mentioned the Chippewa Prairie First Nation. I work with the Janvier family and there are sites that are specifically related to that family. So fortunately, I work in a context where we have additional information that with these tools, we can actually start making those inferences and building those regional maps. But it doesn't, it doesn't work always, for sure. Further to uh, Fraser's question, I will ask, um, how has your experience been with traditional archeological approaches integrating oral history and other forms of traditional knowledge? Um, has there been pushback and how, how do you see that landscape changing now? So that's also a good question, Shane. Uh, yeah, I think that landscape has changed. I mean, I think I'm young enough that I've never had that pushback because the stuff that I'm doing now, it seems to just be regardlessly well accepted that it's like, this is the community speaking, right? On one of my recent papers, the community was an author, right? And so it's, this is our stories. These are what we want to say versus I think there was pushback because there's sometimes there was the archaeologist trying to translate the community, but there was also pushback between uh, like the old archaeologist thinking like this is science versus this is just stories, right? Which is, I think that part, the second part is gone now. I think we all have established that science is just a story as well, right? It, so it's about imagining and trying to combine them together. That's good. Good to hear. Uh, yeah. Roger, we asked whether this technology might be able to be used for East Coast Viking exploration, sites of Vikings on the East Coast. I think it, I think it is actively being used for our, uh, Viking sites on the East Coast. I think if you look up the uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland, uh, I, think they're, I think they're actively using geophysics and surveying techn techniques to, uh, to look for Viking sites. But I, I don't know. I think, I think I heard a graduate student doing that there. <laughs> 